Hey now, welcome to the October 2023 edition of the Living Your Hope Live program. I am your host, Joe Olson. Tonight, we're going to help you look up with a teaching called Returning with Joy. Later tonight, we're going to have the Living Hope family worship team doing a song called Waymaker. Tonight's program is going to be a little bit different. No matter what your beliefs are about biblical prophecy, it's clear that it centers around Israel and God's people there. With the Hamas attack against Israel and the war that's broken out there, Jerry and I felt that it was worthwhile to pause the comedy just this once. It just so happened that our own pastors, Larry and Janet Neville, and their family were there in Jerusalem when the attacks occurred. We want to take a few moments and share their testimony with you. Here's some video of Pastor Larry the day of the attack. This is Pastor Larry Neville. I'm live in Jerusalem right now. And you hear the sirens behind me? They've been going off all morning. Uh, Israel is under attack in the Gaza Strip. Listen to that. It's quiet here, but Israel is under attack. This is the first time that uh, sirens have gone off in Jerusalem in a long time. We're sitting here in Jerusalem, Janet and I, uh, right now. Soldiers are co- have come in, the terrorists have come into Israel. It's a breach of security. It's, it's just an des- uh, unbelievable situation broke out this morning. So we're here and uh, I'm gonna kind of keep things updated as, as, as it goes on, but uh, be in prayer with us over Israel. We know that uh, this is God's timing. There's things happening in this part of the world. Janet and I had planned our 50th anniversary uh, to come to Israel when the uh, COVID hit. And so here we are two and a half years later here in Israel for celebrating our anniversary plus some time together. And that's been going like that all morning. And you could hear the bombs in the background who are, are probably landing about hopefully 80 kilometers from where we're at. Uh, we're not sure, but that's kind of what the, where the, the uh, Gaza Strip would be. God bless you, amen. I, I love to be doing what God has me to do, and we're not worried. We know that God's in control of all things. God bless you. Many of us were in close touch with Larry and Janet during all of this, and certainly thousands of people were praying for them. I'm going to let Janet explain how God answered those prayers. This video was filmed October 15th, eight days after the attacks began. Hi, I just wanted to jump on here and let you guys know how much we appreciate all of your prayers. It means so much to us. We've been so blessed, you know. As you know, Larry and I and Carrie and Adam Friedrich, we were in Israel. We had gotten to Jerusalem on the 6th. And on the 7th, early morning, Carrie and Adam drove down to Masada, down by the Dead Sea. And so we were in our room and all of a sudden we heard the bomb alarms going off and sirens. And so we came out and with like 90 seconds and then from a distance, they have what they call the Iron Dome in Israel and it diffuses like the missiles that Hamas was sending in. And you would just hear the boom in the distance, the boom, and then you would you could see finding like some smoke and um but then we contacted carrie and adam and they came back from they were on their way back from Masada, and we told them you guys better come back because something's going on and that's when we found out that hamas had attacked from the gaza strip they attacked the down by eshkelon israel and as you know we have a church there in eshkelon with pastor Dijan, and his car was completely destroyed during the missile attack And Hamas was ruthless, they were horrible. They went in and they killed women and children and babies and old people and it it seems like they attacked even the few survivors from the Holocaust. They didn't care, they killed. Even today I heard that they were even killing their animals, their dogs and everything. And one young man said they had it, they found a note on one of the terrorists and it said, kill everything that moves, everything that moves. I mean, they were, It was just horrible, the atrocities that we saw on the news here in Israel. And um, so we decided that we would go back to America, but we found out that it was very difficult to get out of America, back to America from Israel. So what we did was we, uh, we went to different airlines and we booked, I think, at least three different tickets and every ticket was canceled, some indefinitely, some until the 20 something of October. 
and there were thousands of people at the Ben Gurion Airport, and we knew that we weren't not going to get out that way. And Adam had read a book by Tim Kennedy, and uh, he has an organization that he runs called um, Save Our Allies. And so he had contacted them, not knowing if we would hear any reply. And we had contacted the U.S. Embassy. They said they weren't doing anything yet. And uh, as soon as Adam contacted them, then they reached out to Adam, our son-in-law. They reached out to Adam. And within two hours, we had filled out paperwork and everything. We sent it in. And it was just not very long after that they contacted us and said that we needed to be in um, Haifa. And there's an airport there, a very, very small airport that's used for uh, private small planes and emergency planes. And so we drove an hour and a half from Jerusalem to Haifa, to the airport there. And these people stayed with us on the phone and can contact with us. They got us through customs. And we've been coming to Israel since 1978. You do not go through customs so easily. And they got us through customs and they we the four of us boarded a six passenger twin engine Cessna and they flew us across the Mediterranean Sea to um, Cyprus. And so we came into Cyprus and once the plane touched down in Cyprus, our Israeli pilots went back to Israel and there was a woman there on the ground. She took us in a van, took us through customs. We didn't have to wait. We went to the front of the line. There were hundreds of people there waiting. I mean, you could just see God orchestrating every step of the way how he took care of us and protected us and got us. She took us all the way to the ticket counter so we could get our, get our tickets to come the rest of the way to America. So we flew that night to Athens, Greece, and we are still in Greece. And it's just amazing to see the hand of God. And we're so thankful to God for the prayers that were offered up on our behalf and how God protected us and got us out of that terrible situation. And we're so thankful. We're so grateful and thankful to Tim Kennedy and his group, Save the Allies, and how they were with us every step of the way. And what's so amazing is it's like they never ask for anything. They didn't ask for any money. They asked for nothing. And in fact, when they got us to Cyprus, they said, thank you for allowing us to help you. And just this morning, I believe today is the 15th, we just got a notification, or the 14th, we just got a notification from the U.S. Embassy. And they said that they will be able to get us out on the 16th from Haifa, the same place we were just at, to Cyprus by boat. And if we sign a uh, promissory note that we will pay the United States government back for any expense that they've had to use to get us to Cyprus. Yet this amazing group, Save the Allies, didn't ask for anything in return. And we are so grateful and thankful. We appreciate each one of your prayers. We're all good. Larry's good. I'm good. Carrie and Adam are good. And we're just so thankful to God that he's been so faithful and he's just protected us and kept us under his wing all of this time. And we love you. And we appreciate each one of you. If you're local to Tucson, every week we have two great opportunities for you to connect and gather with other believers. On Wednesday night at 6.30, we have Living Your Hope in the Lobby, where we have food, prayer, and live teaching with a variety of different speakers. On Sunday, we gather with our church family at 10.30 a.m. to worship. Both of these events happen at Living Hope Family Church at 7333 East 22nd Street. Hope lives here. So everyone knows Jerry Cross, he's just as much part of this program as I am, 
And I just wanted to take a few minutes and chat with him and kind of, uh, you know, share our perspectives on what's going on over there in Israel. Uh, especially, Jerry, when you think about prophecy and the things that the Bible says about the whole world being pulled in to this conflict. And it, it sure kind of looks like that could happen. Yeah, uh, I was thinking that, uh, you know, when Jesus in Luke chapter 20 said that the... Uh, at the end times there would be a distress of nations with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring. And I, I don't think he was referring to hurricanes and stuff. I think he was talking about the seas being the people. And no time in history have I seen riots and distress and, and protest against, well, a little tiny nation of Israel. And other yeah, things. you would think, huh? And, and right now there's 32 conflicts on this earth. There's 32 wars total. So all I can say is Jesus said it was going to be like this. Right. And, and you know, wars, rumors of wars, uh, certainly some things that should give you pause to think about the end times as we are uh, the church. And especially what, what should we as the church be doing um, during this time? I mean, here we are, we're on the other side of the world. That's kind of what our message is going to be about tonight is, is what the church should be doing. But um, I, I just see it as really a, an hour for the church to be about the Father's business. Yeah, I posted a picture of a little tiny figure on this beach with this huge tsunami coming out. We're not going to stop this thing. But all I can see is, <laughs> right. as, as a salvage, all we're trying to do is, is this is the time for the church to rise up because there's so many people asking questions. All I can see it now, we can't do anything to stop it. But it's an opportunity why we're still here to reach as many people as we can. Jesus, Jesus. said these things must come to pass. Yeah, so. And so let's be the church in that yeah. in the meantime. Yeah, man. Opportunity out there. So let's take a, a, a couple minutes and, and just pray together about what's going on over in Israel. God, we are, Lord, just confident in you. We know that you have all things under control. We speak over the nation of Israel. We speak for the peace of Israel. We speak for the people of the Middle East, God. We speak for your people in Israel, God, and we speak your hand of protection and grace upon them, God. I pray, Lord, that you would show yourself strong in that place, God. I pray that you would arise and make yourself known, God, in the midst of the turmoil of this world, God, so that people will turn their hearts towards you in this hour. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Well, I am uh, just honored to be here to speak to you this morning. I uh, have been considering, God, what did you want me to speak? And, and uh, God laid some things on my heart even this week, kind of changed my direction. I'm like, well, I'm, do you want me to speak on prophecy, uh, end times? And, uh, you know, God kind of sent me a different direction. I feel that the question we need to be asking is, what should we as the church be doing in light of everything we see on the news? What should we be doing? What's our part? Where do we, uh, where do we set our foot next? And this is a, some of what God gave me to speak to you this morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, you can open them to Luke chapter 10. I will have it up here, but you know, we like to say that if you have your Bible, open it. Uh, I was reading about three pastors who got together for coffee one day and they found that all of their churches had the same problem. They had a bat infestation problem. And one of the first pastors said, I got so mad, I took a shotgun and fired it at them, but it just made holes in the ceiling and it did nothing to the bats. The next pastor said, well, I, I wanted to be a little more humane than that. I tried trapping them alive, he said, and I caught a, a whole bunch of them. I drove them 50 miles before releasing them, but they all beat me back to the church. Third guy says, well, I haven't had any, any problems with them anymore. They said, well, what, what did you do? He said, well, I simply baptized and confirmed them and they haven't been back since. <laughs> Hopefully we'll have better results than that with those who we pray with to accept the Lord. But I want to speak to you this morning about 
who and what we are and what we're doing in this place. I'm going to kind of embrace the evangelist mode of preaching. That doesn't mean I'm going to yell extra loud or swing my arms around or anything. What it does mean is that I want to build your faith and your confidence to go from this place and take God fully at his word. Amen. Let's go ahead and look at Luke chapter 10. I'm going to begin at verse 17. This sermon is called Returning with Joy. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, but uh, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them to babes. I can't imagine the disciples are all standing there listening to him pray this. I thank you, God, that you've hidden this from smart people. And you showed it to them. They're all like, uh, we're right here. I mean, Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight, all things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the one in whom the Son wills to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. And they're all like, yep, that's us, us babes. Let's talk first about Christians in church. You know, there's a vast difference between going to church and being the church. Amen. Thank God we come to church. I'm glad you're here. It would be just me and that chair right there. I'd be yelling at it this morning. If you weren't here, I've done it before. But there's a big difference between going to church and being the church. Personally, I love the church culture, okay? I love, do you love the church culture? Amen. I love the church culture, but uh, let's be honest. It's undeniable that we're somewhat of a strange sub subculture, aren't we? Now, and not as many amens. Did he just call us strange? I didn't call you babes. Okay, so, but we are a little strange. Things happen in church that don't happen anywhere else. All my years working at Chili's, no one ever gave me a word at work. Hey, Joe, let me give you a word. They gave me a lot of words. They were not words I can repeat here. But we come into church and people speak in tongues and lay hands on the sick and pray. They testify. They say things like hallelujah and praise the Lord. We do this in church. It's our church culture. We like it. The disciples, they had no problem ministering with Jesus. I mean, think about their average day. You know, Jesus comes walking over the water. Wakes up a couple of dead people, feeds everyone in sight, confounds the Pharisees all in a day's work. That's a great day of, of ministry. And the disciples are like, yeah, yeah, we're with him. Yeah. Whenever Jesus was around, man, they were like, this is great, great. Get him, Jesus. This is cool. Have you ever noticed that things that seem natural here stop feeling natural after you walk out the door? I want to challenge you to uh, try to go to work tomorrow and take an offering. <laughs> Just take one of these with you. Walk up to your friend at work. Hey, how's it going, Reuben? Good. Oh, excuse, oh, excuse me, did I drop this? How are you doing, yeah? How about them Dodgers, huh? What do you think? You think they're really going to give during the season? You think? Nothing? Nothing? Okay. You sure? I like the way the ushers give you that look as they walk by. <laughs> Try that at work. Eugene! How's it going, Eugene? Good. Pal? No? Okay. Just thought I'd try. It's fine. It doesn't feel the same outside of here, does it? Try responding to your boss the way you respond to the pastor who's preaching. 
He gets up tomorrow at work and he says, uh, all right, we're behind on this project, but we're going to put in some extra overtime. Amen. We're way over budget and uh, we need to let a few of you go. Hallelujah. And no one here is getting a raise this year. Preach it, man. It's not the same. I'm not saying that we live a double life or that we're acting and living one way at church and another at home or at work. I'm just saying that we experience a culture shift when we walk out the doors of the church, right? Is everyone with me? Follow me? Somebody said amen because we're in church. Remember when you go to the, uh, uh, the pier or the beach and they had those uh, headless frame, they had the, the frame painted with the, this hole in the face where you stick your face in there and you take the picture? And you think, you know, what's funny about it is that the face doesn't always fit the body. I, I sometimes wonder how would, if we could picture Christ as the head in our local church as the body of believers, would the world laugh at that? Or would they stand in awe of how it just fits so perfectly? See, we have the impression that Jesus fits better on us when we're gathered together in the church building than he does when we're out rubbing shoulders with the world around us. There's a slogan for Las Vegas. What happens in Vegas stays in Las Vegas. Really what happens in Las Vegas is you lose your money and it stays in Las Vegas. That's what happens. If, 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 if it all stayed in Vegas, they would meet you at the edge of town and give you your money back. Here, we don't want that to affect your life. But that saying does not apply to the kingdom of God. What happens in church does not stay in church. What happens in church should go outside of the church. I'm not saying that we're called to go out there and make a spectacle of ourselves, but our call is to go out of here and put Jesus on display. Do you realize that you are the only Bible that some people will ever get to read? Let that sink in for a second. You're the only Bible that some people are going to read. Now, what translation are we? Are we the abridged? Are we the muted Bible? Are we the amplified Bible? I don't know, but think about it. Because people are reading our lives like the scripture. He is reflected in our thought and our word and our deeds. Every generation has the right to see Jesus. Can you imagine being in that first century of, of seeing Jesus walking by with those 12 guys going, we're babes, we're just babes, following him, we're babes. Seeing him raising people from the dead, healing people, speaking the word of God with authority. Can you imagine, don't you think that this generation has the right to see Jesus? They have the right to see Jesus in you and I. It brings me to the signs following. I was praying with a pastor friend of mine once and I was praying for God to manifest himself in power in our church. God, show yourself in our services and healing and salvation and deliverance and gifts of the spirit. And he stopped me while I was praying. Hey, I'm praying here. I know I'm stopping you from praying. He said, I want you to pray that same prayer again. But I want you to pray for those things to happen outside of your church building. What a challenge to our heart. What a shift in our thinking. God, I want to see healing and salvation and deliverance and gifts of the spirit outside the walls of this church. Because we're not called to just go to church, we're called to be the church. I love this portion of scripture, it's so weird. Jesus sends out 70 of his followers two by two with instructions. He says, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And they're like, wow, that's a trip. I mean, this is the same stuff they watch Jesus do every day. He is out there. The devil is subject to him. They see him do powerful things and they're kind of standing behind him going. They feel safe behind Jesus. They feel safe in church. Jesus was church. I feel safe right here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get him, Jesus. Get him. There's one. Get him. 
Now Jesus is sending them on ahead to all the places he's about to go and telling them to go and take the authority of the kingdom of God on ahead. How many of you realize Jesus is coming back? Jesus is, if you don't feel that in the news, if you don't feel that in the world around you, Jesus is coming back. What is the church supposed to be doing right now? We're supposed to be going on out before where Jesus is about to go and declaring the kingdom of God, declaring his power, declaring his kingdom and saying the authority of God is here. That is what the church should be doing in this hour. The disciples are like, cool, Jesus, that's cool. So you're coming, right? Because all those things seem perfectly normal and natural when you're in church, but now they're sent out to do them in the context of being outside the church. I remember some years ago, we were on an outreach downtown Tucson. This was before downtown Tucson was nice. But we're down there preaching and it's a sad, we would go out on Saturday nights before church on Sunday, a group, a bunch of us young people, and we'd be out there preaching and witnessing and challenging people to get saved. And people were just ignoring us. That's what they were doing. They're ignoring us. You know, that's what happens a lot of times when you go out and you're going out in faith and power and people just ignore you. But we're out there witnessing and, we're, and I see a, a, a group of four young men coming and one of them is limping so bad. And I said, sir, God wants to heal you because God told me, pray for that guy. And there was a place he could sit down right there and we sat him down and scooted his hips back and held up his legs and one leg is significantly shorter than the other. And we begin to pray and his leg grew out right there in front of everyone's eyes. He stood up, his pain was gone, his limp was gone. Those four guys prayed and asked Jesus into their hearts. See, you and I have been given the authority and are authorized to conduct business of the kingdom of God outside of this place. Do you realize you're authorized? You realize you have the authority to do this. Okay, I always practically have scoliosis from the amount of keys on my, on my, and there's less of them there than when I was a restaurant manager. Then it was kind of like walking like this all the time. But you know what keys are? Keys are access. Keys are authority. They mean I can go to this place where other people can't go. God has given you the keys of the kingdom. He's given you the authority to conduct his business here while he is coming. What do we do? What are we doing with that authority? I'll have a number one supersize with that Coke. We just kind of walk through life doing what we're doing. Like we're not carrying any keys at all. Or that's me. I won't put that on you. Listen to Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 18, familiar scripture. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. These signs will follow those who believe. Just checking, who here believes in Jesus? Okay, you believe in him? Okay, then he's talking to you here. These signs will follow those who believe. That's all of us. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly th- anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. It says in Matthew 16, 19, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. How often does someone say, hey, will you pray for this for me? Do you realize you have the authority to bind and loose things? To say, you know what? I bind the strategy that's coming against your life. I loose the power of God upon you to touch you, to physically heal you, to bring your deliverance, to, to bring you provision. I loose that on you. Do we speak with the authority that God's given us? Do we pull out our keys and say, yes, I can get in there? We have the same order as the 70s. Same orders as the 70s. To go to the people before Jesus arrives and declare the kingdom of God. 
And when the 70 returned, they were as surprised as anyone that it had all happened. Do you get that impression? Jesus, you're never going to guess what happened. You cast out demons? Yeah. 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 <laughs> you healed the sick? Yeah. Yeah. It worked. It's crazy. It worked. They're shocked. Just like we would be, right? They're surprised. It says the 70 return with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. See, there is a danger of having nothing but an intellectual gospel where you know your doctrines. You can sit there and you can rattle off scriptures. You can talk the Bible. You can talk church. You can talk religion. But what happens when it's time to lay hands on the sick? What happens when it's time to cast out the devil? What happens when it's time to speak the power and the authority of God? We don't want to just have an intellectual gospel that's void of power to transform people's lives. Second Timothy chapter three, verse five says that this generation will have a form of godliness, but deny its power. In other words, when we leave the manifest power of God out of the equation, we're left with nothing but religious form or a spiritual argument. I, I will not spend my time doing spiritual arguments. You know, don't, don't fall for it on Facebook, okay? Someone throws out the bait. You want to get on there and spend your whole day arguing with someone on Facebook? I got a few things you could do for me. I, I don't got to tell you, you got more time than I do, apparently. Don't waste your time. This is why Jesus calls out to, calls us to go out and express his power, not just our Christian morals and not just our Christian culture. God didn't call you to go out and spread his morality. Oh, that's wrong. I see you're doing that. That's wrong. Christians don't do that. Well, so what? Are you going to go get them? Are you going to moralize them? What if they convert? They can still go to hell even, even though they're being moral. That's right. We're not converting people to our morality. We're not converting them to our culture. You should cut your hair and not dress like that. This is how you should look. We don't drink and we don't smoke and we don't, we don't do drugs. Come on, let's go to the buffet and talk about it. <laughs> oh my our first calling is to go out as a witness of God. A wit what does that even mean? We are a witness of what God has done in our lives. You know you have a testimony. You're the believing ones in Jesus, right? That means you have a testimony. That means you can say, this is what I was. I encountered Jesus. And now here's what I am. And what I am is different than what I was because of Jesus. That's what a testimony is. That's how simple it is. The signs are not there. Uh, they're not the primary goal or focus of our ministry. They're a tool to validate what? Our witness. Our testimony. He said, go out and preach the gospel to all the world. Go tell them this message. Give them this, this, the, the good news. And these signs, they're going to be there to, to stand as a, a validation of what you're saying. In court, an eyewitness is a powerful tool. But you combine that witness with some physical evidence, and guess what? Now you got a conviction. Amen. The signs that follow the believing ones are to validate God's claim on us and our claims of Him. Amen. See, here is the thing about the promise it's promised when we go. That's right. <laughs> We want to test everything in here where it's safe. Because no matter how weird I act, you guys will still like me. That's Joe. He's just like that. But Jesus says, all these things, I'm going to make you a promise. These are promised to you as you go. But God says it's for out there. See, when, when we're seeing God saving and healing and delivering out there, then we will return with joy and there's no question those same things will happen here. See, there's another side of this equation. 
we tend to think that if we could just pull off some miracles, the whole world would get saved. Not so. Not so. I've had people challenge me, if God is real, let him prove himself. Let him light up that bush and talk to me. How many of you heard the old light up the bush and talk to me thing? I tell them if God lit up that bush and talked to you, you would drop dead. God is being merciful to you by not lighting up that bush and talking to you right now. Instead, God sent me. Sorry. I am the lit up bush that you're getting today. He's God. He's not a laser light show at the planetarium. He's not doing magic tricks today. Hey, kids, watch me pull a Pharisee out of my hat. That's, he's not doing tricks. However, come to God on his terms, repent, believe, he will prove himself to you. This is what I tell them, the light up the bush crowd. So you want to know God, you want to see the miraculous power of God, come to God on his terms. Repent. Ask him to come into your heart. Confess that you're a sinner. Decide to follow him. You will see more miracles. You will see more of the power and the presence of God than you can stand. Miracles are not enough for those who have decided not to believe. Think about the day and hour we're living in. Do you believe anything you see on TV? If you do, we'll be, you know, praying for people after service. Because we have AI, we have Photoshop, we have deep fake. Uh, we can make you or anyone else say or do anything, anything we want. So what do you think is going to happen in a world? We, we're living in a world that already, it's been like a week and they're already going, I don't think anyone really got hurt in Israel. I think that's just all a trick. Yeah. You think they're going to be convinced by your special effects. Jesus said in Luke 16 that they would not believe even if someone raised from the dead, which he went on to prove himself. When Moses confronted Pharaoh, he did the signs that God had given him. He said, God, they're not gonna believe me. What should I do? He says, well, I'll tell you what, stick your hand in your shirt. When you pull it out, it'll be white with leprosy. Put it back. And that's where we got the song. Da, 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 da. He says, pull it out. It'll be normal again. And then he says, well, what if they don't believe that? Well, throw down your stick. It's going to become a serpent. Pick it up and it'll become a, 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 a staff again. So Moses gets there and he does this stuff. And God says, or Pharaoh says, hey, no, whatever. Hey, Laurel Hardy, come over here. Do the same thing. And they did. Of course, Moses' stick ate their stick, so there. <laughs> Let me finish up this morning. I want to talk to you about celebrating the church. Sunday should be a reason to celebrate. This is not the event. This is the huddle. You watch football? Do you watch the Cowboys? No. Did you? <laughs> oh, dear Lord. God, how they know not what they do. Please help them, God. If you watch any team, the game's not played in the huddle. They go out in the field, they execute a play. Then they come back to the huddle and they're dusting each other off. Oh, you really got hit on that one, huh? Yes, you all right? Okay. And they check, and they, okay, here's what we're going to do next. Do you know that church is the huddle? This is where we come together, where we dust ourselves off after a week of playing the game out there. And we say, let's regroup. Let's get our heads back together. Let's refocus on what we're here to do and what our goal is and where are we going. We're going to go out there and touch the world. Okay, everyone, break. Church should be a celebration. This text is a moment, a great moment in Jesus's ministry. Because read about it, man. Read about his struggles in, in this book and, and his weariness. He is weary. He's struggling. He's ministering. There's battles going on. You can read just past this and you see the Pharisees are just about to start in on him again. You can even feel his frustrations. But here is a moment of pure joy. What caused it? He 
He says to the disciples, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. You want to talk about a miracle. You want to talk about something that just is powerful beyond anything you've seen or, or, or heard. Our power as we go out into the world is not about what spiritual tricks we can perform or how eloquently we can share the Bible. It's about the fact that God has taken this and he has written my name in the Lamb's book of life and given me an, inter an eternal her inheritance. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, is, that is the greatest, I am the greatest miracle you're going to see today. Somebody goes, we are. Okay, you too. <laughs> Jesus is telling us, don't get caught up in the signs that it is the salvation that we are getting excited about. He says in verse 22, all things have been delivered to me by my father and no one knows who the son is except the father and who the father is except the son and the one to whom the son wills to, to reveal him. You know, I, I, I think about that guy who got healed downtown. I didn't see him in church the next morning or his friends. I've not seen them since. Now, maybe they went to another church. Maybe he's serving God. Maybe he's going to walk up to me in heaven and do a little dance and go, hey, watch this. Still works. I don't know. But the greatest miracle would have been if that guy was sitting on the front row here with me this morning saying, yes, I have been serving God for 30 years. I've been serving the Lord and I've given him my life and I have followed him with all my heart because this is the greatest miracle. It's when, we, when someone can look at your life or look at my life and recognize Jesus. You are the Bible. When they look at you and recognize Jesus, a miracle is taking place. Jesus takes time to stop and rejoice that these 70 disciples had discovered that they could go out and be the church. That is what they learned. That they could go out and be the church. And more important than the power that we can display is the witness that we bear to Jesus himself. I read about a museum in Greenfield Village, Detroit, Michigan, and there is a huge steam locomotive there. And beside this complicated piece of machinery is a sign showing boiler pressure, size and number of wheels, horsepower, lengths, weight, and more. And at the bottom line indicates that 96% of the power generated by that steam mo motor is used just to move the locomotive itself. It only leaves 4% to pull the load. Wow, wow, I was right. Kind of reminds me of the church. <laughs> we use all of our strength and all of our power to do this. And the percentage, the greater percentage of what we need is out there. As a church, we really need to be careful about how and where we spend our strength and our energy. Jesus told us, go into all the world and preach the gospel. The danger to us here today is that we must not spend our strength to go into the building and call it church. We are called to be a witness. We hear the word witness and we immediately picture ourselves in an uncomfortable place trying to unravel biblical theology that we ourselves don't really fully understand to a stranger that doesn't really want to hear it. And we think that's what witnessing is. We see ourselves. Well, you see, there's the Urim and the Thummim and uh, the frogs come out of the Euphrates and then we die to ourselves. Would you like to come to church this Sunday with me? No, you Philistine. Just shake the dust off my feet. That's not what being a witness is. We're not calling you to, to recite theology to someone. We're calling you to say, here is what I was. I met Jesus and here is what I am. One of my pastor friends said to me, he said, there's a difference between witnessing and being a witness. Think of a witness in a courtroom setting. They have seen something with their own eyes. They have had a personal experience. They're not a technical expert. They're simply there to say, this is what happened to me. That is what a witness is. Do you think you can witness? Amen. 
Do you think those who say we believe in Jesus, those who have had an encounter, those who were this, and now they're this because they met Jesus, are we ones that can go and say, this is what happened to me? Not everyone's gifted to be an evangelist. We're not trying, uh, we're not all compelled to stop every stranger we see and try to press them with the claims of Christ. But if we are a Christian, if we are those who believe, then we are a witness to what has happened to us personally when we, in, when, when we encounter Jesus Christ for ourselves. I love Mark chapter five and the demoniac. It says, when he got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. Notice Jesus didn't advise the demoniac to go get a theological degree. You know, you should go and really brush up on your Hebrew and your Greek and, you know, make sure you're conjugating all your verbs correctly. He just said, look, uh, someone might notice that you're now wearing clothes and not screaming and cutting yourself. And they might want to know what happened. Can you just go tell them? That was the assignment he gave them. How powerful is that? How powerful is that? It was just about that obvious when I got saved. People at work were like, hey, he doesn't, he, he, hey, it doesn't seem like you want to punch me in the face anymore when I say hello. Has something changed? <laughs> yes, something has. We're talking about being the church rather than simply going to church. I want to be clear about how we do this. If we want to be a witness that is changing our world, let's do three things. First, let's make a difference. How do we make a difference? You know, you can make a difference just by saying a kind word or deed. It's not like, you know, you run down. I'm going to take you down the Roman road. You know, they're like, I, why? Why? Well, leave the police. What is it to make a difference? Sometimes it's just saying a kind word or doing a kind thing. You know the word Samaritan was practically like cussing at someone before Jesus told a parable about a stranger's kindness? If you called somebody a parable or a Samaritan, you better be ready to fight because you just cussed at them. Jesus takes that word and turns it to mean a kind stranger. Make a difference. If you want to go a little further, make a friend. I can extend myself a bit further outside of my comfort zone. And I'm not, let me be clear, I'm not talking about making somebody your project. How many of you know people know when you just want something from them? You know, you, you, <laughs> no one wants to be your project. We're talking about investing ourselves in other people. We're talking about seeing them the way God sees them and beginning to invest. How many of you know Christ loved us before we were Christians? Yes, yes. <laughs> he died for us before yes. we were saved. Yes, yes. Thirdly, make a follower. You know, you might win a spiritual debate without doing the other two things. But to lead someone to follow Christ requires more. We're not just looking for someone who can, you know, out argue the sinners you know I stopped him dead he'll never accept Christ but I won that argument you say well what are you telling us to do are you, are you telling us to go out and start trying to perform miracles in the street hey if God tells you to do that do it right. it's a blast it's a thrill but what I am saying is that God has promised his power to those who go out and be a witness to what he has done in their lives. I am calling you to go be a witness. You say, well, I don't even know how to start that conversation. Didn't we just talk about that? Make a difference. Make a friend. Then the conversations will happen. 
When we testify to what Jesus has done in us, Jesus himself shows up. When Jesus shows up, hearts are changed, bondages are broken, bodies get healed, people are no longer by the, ruled by the devil's plan for their lives. As witnesses to what God has done in us, we are authorized agents of the kingdom of God. We have the keys. We carry it in us and we bring it with us out of these doors and out there into the world. Wherever we go, whoever we encounter, whatever we speak, we bring Jesus. That's kind of scary considering how I behave when I drive. Just something to think about. When we come in here on Sunday morning, we want to celebrate what happened in church all through the week. Because church is out there, folks. That's where the game is. We want to return with joy and rejoice that God's kingdom has come into our world. As you're watching this program tonight, maybe you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. I'm going to say a simple prayer. If you want to know that your heart's right with God, I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. I believe God will honor that. God, we come before you. We thank you, God, that you are in control. We thank you, God, that you laid down your life so that we could know you. I ask, God, that you would forgive us. God, that you would wash our sins away. Let us know you personally from this night forward in the name of Jesus. Jesus. Amen. In light of the Neville's testimony, I thought this song was fitting. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. Worship you, worship you. We make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness.
My friends, pray for Israel until we meet again. Live in your hope. The Lord bless you.